Now we greet you again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium in the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. You that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. I'm hoping the hour coming up we can be a real inspiration to everyone. Now the Lord willing, tomorrow morning I'll pay my final weekly bill at WNGC office. More than 40 years I've been paying my radio bill on Monday morning. I refuse to go in debt to the station. I always pay my bills right on time. Did that more than 40 years. But tomorrow morning I'll be paying my final weekly bill, which includes this past week and today. And then my radio bill will be for the Sunday broadcast only. And starting next Sunday, we're going to uh, let the Sunday broadcast be an entirely faith broadcast. I'll explain to the church to close the service this morning what I have in mind. Uh, we have a few dear shut ins out there, dear ladies, men that maybe draw their social security or whatnot. They're sending a little offering along for the broadcast, and they feel they have a part in it, and that's what they want. And for that reason, we're going to maintain the Sunday morning service from 11 to 12 as a faith ministry to give those that invest in the broadcast an opportunity to continue to do so. And so, you pray for me and write to me. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. And I want you to pray for me that God direct us in the future about our radio ministry and so forth. We covet your prayers. But you pray for me and write to me next week. If you'd like to write in and get our book on the Holy Spirit, 52 7 point outlines on the Holy Spirit. If you'd like to get Brother Lewis book on the Song of Solomon. If you'd like to have a list of our tape, tape today will be number 350. We have 350 tapes that Sunday morning messages and music available at $3 each. You can get a list of at least 240 we have listed here. Tape today will be tape number 350. And I'm speaking today on this subject, the two milk cows that left their calves and went on a mission. Two milk cows that left their caves and went on a mission. And so we'll be speaking on that line of thought this morning. And uh, I want you to listen. It'll be tape 350 and write in and get it. And by the way, you need to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 6 for my text. I also have a, a brochure on a proposed Holy Land tour. This is one of the greatest yet price-wise. And you might write in and say, Preach Edward, send me the brochure on the Holy Land tour. Uh, you might drop by and get it. You might uh, uh, call in or write in for it. We'll be delighted to let you look it over. If you ever considered going, I think when you look over this brochure, you'll be wanting to go. And we have some people that's already signed up and they're enthused about it and can't hardly wait. That time will be here before you know it. We'll be leaving on March the 7th and time really flies. Before you know it, it's going to be Thanksgiving and Christmas and then time for the Holy Land tour almost. And so you write in and get your name on the list. Now my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603. We do covet your prayers. You turn to 1 Samuel chapter 6. Now we're old-fashioned, fundamental, independent, missionary Baptist, premillennial, and Northside Baptist Church, the church where everybody is somebody, and every man puts his feet on the floor just alike. We're just about as independent as little Casey Allen, little daughter of, of uh, our pianist, Debbie and Matt Allen, and the granddaughter of Nancy Louise Smith and Jack. And she's quite independent. I'll tell you what, what I mean by that. The other day, the her mother stepped out the door and the door closed and locked her out. And of course, little Casey's on the inside and mama couldn't get in. And she said, uh, uh, Casey, look in my pocketbook and find my keys and unlock the door. So Casey goes and finds the pocketbook, start rambling for the keys and found a big box of raisins in there. And so she just sat down there and 
He'd every one of them raisins one at a time. And the mama stand out there begging to open the door. Now, I don't know how long it took her to eat that box of raisins one at a time, but she's pretty independent. And when she got through with that box of raisins, she got the key and opened the door. And she's only about two and a half years old, not quite two and a half years old, but she's well known around Northside here and covers all the ground she walks on. And we have many sweet little ones around here, and we love them all, we appreciate them. And some of them seem to reach out and grab you more than others. That's the way it is in life for all of us. And so uh, that little case, is she draws your attention all right, but she's independent. And that's all right. I'm not fussing about that. Turn in your Bible, will you please, to 1 Samuel chapter 6. I believe the next time Mama steps out the door, she'll take her keys with her. Now, I mentioned the uh, fellowship, the Stricklands, the restaurants. You know, they very graciously said, Preacher, if you don't uh, have your fellowship hall ready, you can come back out and be with us again. They took care of us the last fellowship meeting, and everything worked out fine, and I still hear people talking about it. And everything's a good, plenty of good food out there. And they said you can come back. And we had a good place to go back to, but we're hoping to get into the fellowship. The only thing about that Strickland's restaurant, when I go out there and sit down and eat, I eat too much. I'm telling you what's the truth. Good old country cooks out there, and I just can't hardly beat it. And uh, I enjoy going out there to eat. I appreciate them being willing to uh, let us come back for the fellowship. All right, your Bible's now open. At 1 Samuel chapter 6. And I begin reading with verse 7. Before I start reading, I want to say this. That the Philistines had captured the ark of God. They had taken that most sacred, precious ark of God. And captured that from the Israelis. And seemed like the curse of God came on them. When they set it down by Dagon, their God, their false God. And Dagon fell over and Broke himself to pieces and just seemed like it was a curse on them everywhere they carried that ark. And so it's somewhat like a hot potato. They want to get rid of it. They said, we can't keep this thing. Look like everywhere we place it, there's a curse. Something happens. And we want to get this ark back to the Israelites. Get it off our hands. Because we don't want to have this curse on us. As some of them broke out with, in, with a, a siege of illness because of it. And uh, great things are happening. They said, we've got to get rid of this ark. And so they decided to give it back to Israel. And they got ready to move it back uh, to Israel. For the ark to be moved back to Israel. And with that in mind, I begin reading with verse 7. Now therefore make a new cart and two milk cows, a kind, it says here means milk cows, on which there has come no yoke, and tie the kind to the cart, and bring their calves home from them. So you see here the case is taken away from them. And take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart and put the jewels of gold which you return him for a, tre a trespass offering and a coffer by the side thereof and send it away that it may go. And see if it goeth up by the way of his own coast, the best you miss, then he hath done us, then he hath done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not the hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. And the men did so and took the two milk cows and tied them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. Notice that again. The phrase, shut up their calves at home. And they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart and the coffer with the mice of gold and the image, images of the emeralds. And the kind took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And the Lord of the Philistines went after them under the border of Beth Shemesh. And there Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. And the cart came into the field of Joshua, a Beth Shemite, and stood there. Well, there was a great stone, and they clave the wood of the ark and offered the kind a uh, burnt offering unto the Lord. Now that's reading from 1 Samuel chapter 6, verses 7 through 14, page 324 and 25 in the original Scofield Reference Bible. 
I do have a few on hand. If you're thinking about getting somebody a Bible for Christmas, I always keep a few that might save you a little on it. When I get a chance to buy some of those Bibles at a good price, I do so and save the people about $10 at least on a Bible. I have some in my study in case you're interested. I'm not in the Bible setting business. I just like to accommodate people that like to have a good original Schofield reference Bible. Now if you notice here, these two milk cows had a job to do. They went on a mission. And uh, you know what a cow is, I'm sure. You know what milk is. Yonder in the city of New York a few years ago, there's a family that had never been in the country. They'd never been out, out of the city. Always lived right there in the heart of the city and never been in the country. So one Sunday afternoon, they decided to take a ride out in the country and they got the children in the car. Drove many miles out in the country. Now they've been getting their milk in a bottle every morning. The milkman would leave the milk at the door and that's all those children knew. They knew it was cow's milk and knew it was in a bottle. And so they were riding along and there they saw a, a great huge pile of bottles beside of a dairy barn. And one of the little fellows in the car said, Look yonder, Daddy. He said, Yon's a cow's nest. So they didn't know the difference between a stack of milk bottles and they thought they'd found a cow's nest. Well, a lot of people that's never been out in the country don't know what they miss. I remember one time we had a, a cousin to come from Atlanta and here's another one of these city slickers and he wanted to help milk the cows. My father was a dairyman in those days in a small way and we milked the cows every morning and he wanted to milk the cow and he tried to milk the cow and I probably got on the wrong side and the cow didn't like it and she uh, kicked around and crammed her foot in what milk you had in the container. And he thought, well, I certainly got a mess here now. I don't know what to do. And the thought came to him, I'll just go and, and pour it down a mouth and maybe come out clean. So he was trying to get the cow to take the milk back because it had been all fouled up. Now these uh, city slickers, they, they got a lot to learn, a lot to know. And uh, we, we, we are country boys. I have a lot to learn about the city, but the crowing of a rooster and the bark of the dog, the lord of a cow, the neigh of a mule will put something in you that a mill whistle won't put in you. I guarantee you that. All right, we're talking about these two milk cows. Now notice number one, they forsook all they had. All they had were two little calves and they left them. The Bible says in verse 10, then the men did say, uh, and did go and took the two milk cows and tied them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. So these poor milk cows, they loved their little calves, but they had to go on a mission. They had to carry that cart away from the Philistines. And so they left their calves behind. They forsook all they had. In Luke chapter 14 and verse 33, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all he hath, cannot be my disciple. Jesus said, if you want to be a true disciple, a real disciple, then you got to forsake what you have. Now that's what these cows did, and that's what we must do in order to be a real disciple. Now we have some people today that talk real creamy, but to live a Blue John life. God wants us to live a creamy life to the glory of God, and we must forsake what we have in a sense let nothing come between us and God if we're going to be our best for God. And these cows left all they had back in the stall and went on their way to carry out their mission. Number two, they were placed on these cows, the ark of God, uh, which is a symbolic of power and God's presence. That ark was a symbol of God's very presence and a symbol of God's power. And so they had the ark put on the cart. Now the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon us. We shall be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and out to them as part of the earth. Now they had the very presence of the power of God there with them. Those cows that moved down the dusty road had that ark, most precious to the Israelites. And it, uh, it a symbol of God's very presence and a symbol of God's power. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 3, the Bible said, The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people does not consider. 
And so the Bible says an ox knows his master's crib. He knows where to go, get what he needs. God said, my people, they don't sit, consider, they don't realize they ought to be in God's house on Sunday or getting their spiritual food and worshiping God. They don't realize that my people uh, just doesn't know even like an ox. An ox knows where to go get his food, but said my people don't know. They don't realize the real value of being in God's house on the Lord's day to be fed from the word of God and to worship God. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, the Bible says we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. So we must have the presence and the power of God in our lives if we ever expect to get anything accomplished to the glory of God. Now, God is no respect of person. God wants to be real to you. God wants you to know He's present. God wants you to have His power. And many of us today living a firecracker life in atomic age for God, and we should be living a powerful life for God in these last days. And so they had the power of God, and of course the nearness of God, the presence of God, there with them as they pull that cart down the little dusty road. Number three, they walk the straight way. Now these cows walk the straight way. The Bible says in verse 12, And the cows took the straight way to the way of Beshemeth and went along the highway. Now these cattle didn't uh, maneuver around the side of the road and take a shortcut or go around a, a, a certain area. The Bible said they took the highway and made a straight shot. They went straight on the straight way to where they were to carry that ark. Now the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14, Any of you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many shall go in thereof, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life eternal. And only a few will find it. Now according to this Bible, there's a straight and a narrow way for God's people. We are not to go down the broad way, down the highway of the world, and not run with the crowd to do evil, but to walk the straight and narrow way. God's way is a straight and narrow way. When you get saved, you get on God's road and that straight and narrow it's not like the broad road that's leading to hell and millions going there every few days falling into hell without God. You're on the straight and narrow road that leads to life eternal where you're going to be forever with God. And you need to realize that and walk in that straight and narrow way. We have too many today that's falling aside, some falling on the wayside on the right, some on the left. Uh, some falling and, and uh, remaining backslidden in a backslidden state, not doing anything for God. And we need to be moving straight forward and keep on down the straight and narrow way until we get home. Don't deviate from the straight path. A lot of people are compromised. They try to live for God on Sunday and the devil on Monday. But that doesn't please God. I'm reminded of the man that his cow got lost and he went out to try to find the old milk cow and he searched and searched and searched and he couldn't find her. Came back home, he said to his wife, I want you to help me. He said, let's go down here beside the creek and, and you get on one side of the creek and I'll get on the other and we're going to find that cow because she may be on both sides of this creek. And so you have a lot of people like that today. They, they want to be on both sides, be with the devil one day and God the other. Now you can't straddle the fence in that manner and please God. You gotta walk on God's side. Not say good God Sunday and, and good devil Monday. Not saying oh how I love Jesus on Sunday and pistol packing mama on Monday. You need to sing the songs of Zion and serve God and stay on God's side and not try to think you can go on both sides and eat grapes on both sides of the fence. You can't do that. Not and please God. And so these cows went straight down the road. They had a destination. They had an objective. They had to go where this ark was to be taken. And they just went straight down that road. One didn't try to pull aside and go in another direction or didn't try to pull into the ditch or go around maybe a, a little hill. They went straight down the road. 
And every child of God, regardless of the obstacles you face, you need to go straight down the road for God. The devil will deviate you. He'll get you uh, over here on, on the sideline somewhere. And you'll find out that you're not being used and blessed of God. A man one time went, uh, went deer hunting. Took his dog out deer hunting. And, and the dog trailed a deer for a short period of time. And then he came to a place where there's a, a rabbit cross the deer track. And he took off after the rabbit. And he came to another place where a rat had crossed the rabbit track. And he took off after the rat. Now when his master found him, he's scratching and sniffing in a rat hole. Now if you're not careful, if you start deer hunting, and then a rabbit crosses the deer track, then you're to go on after deer, not take off after rabbit. If you have a mind set to do something for God, a goal set, then don't let anything deviate you from that path, a sidetrack you. You're to move right on for God. And God will bless you. You know what God wants you to do. You know what your objective is. You know what God has given you to do. And don't ever be sidetracked. Because if you do, you're the sure loser. Number four, we find that these cows voiced out as they journeyed. Now these cows didn't just move along silently. And nobody knew this coming down the road. Man alive, you could hear these cows coming no doubt a mile and a half up the road. No doubt some of the farmers and people attending the vineyards and keeping the sheep said, Listen, I believe I hear some cows lowing. And way up the road, they were lowing. Right on down the road, they were lowing. They're letting people know they were coming along. They didn't keep quiet. The Bible says in verse 12, And the kind took the straight way, the way of Bethshemeth, and went along the highway lowing as they went. They went along the highway letting people know they were doing a job. They had the ark of God. They had the presence of God. They had the power of God in that ark. And they was letting all the people know they had a mission to perform. And they were going down the road lowing as they went. I believe both of them, they lowered as loud as they could down that road. And you could hear them for a long way. No doubt somebody said, I believe those cows can lower the loudest of any cows I ever heard in my life. Well, they had the presence of God in that ark and the power of God. Now, if you know God, you ought to do some talking for God. You need to talk for Jesus every day. You can't remain silent and glorify God. Man one time got saved and he dreaded going back to the place where he worked because he knew they'd be ridiculing him, laughing at him and, and making light of him. And he told the people, I want you all to pray for me when I go back on my job. And because I know if they know I'm saved, then they're going to laugh at me and pick at me and ridicule me. And I need your prayers. So he went back. And about a week he came back to the group of Christian people that had been praying for him. They said, well, how did you make out? He said, just fine. Said they never didn't know I'd been saved. Well, now people are not going to know you're saved unless you tell them about it. You can't keep your mouth shut. You can stop cussing out loud and that won't do it. You can quit drinking beer and you should if you're a beer guzzler. You leave that slop off and uh, you, that'll help you. And then uh, you need to let people know that you're saved. And know that you're living for God. And, and know you want to be used. you got to tell people. Does people on your job know that you know God? Do they know that you're a born again believer? Can they say this person that works here with me is a born-again believer? He knows God. Several years ago, a young man was saved in my ministry. God called him to preach, and he worked in a certain place. I won't name the spot, but he started carrying his Bible with him every day. He didn't do any more than just take his Bible. He walked in and out of there with his Bible. Lay his Bible down there close to his machine, and in and out of that place he'd go with his Bible. That guy irritated the, the foreman and it wasn't long until the foreman sent him out and told him not to come back anymore. All because he carried his Bible to work with him. Now people knew that this boy loved God and loved his Bible. And if he wanted to take it, that was his business. If you want to take your Bible where you work, that's your business. And so uh, they, they shouldn't resent it. As long as you don't get up and try to preach to them. If you try to do that out of your Bible, they might... 
uh, have some come back against you, but just carry your Bible with you. I don't see any law against that whatsoever. But anyway, he lost his job because of, he wanted people to know he was saved. He loved God and appreciated that book. Dwight L. Moody said the greatest sermon he ever saw in his life was a man walking down the street with a Bible under his arm. You shouldn't be ashamed to do things for God. And these cows, their voices, their journeying, they kept on lowing. And in Isaiah chapter 62 and verse 6, Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silent. The Bible said if you go to make mention of God, don't keep silent. Tell people about it. Let them know you're saved. Let them know you love Jesus. Let them know that you're a member of the Northside Baptist Church. Let them know you believe in a fundamental Bible believing place to worship. Let them know that. I'm always glad to see our people coming in with Bibles in their hands. Every Christian ought to bring his Bible to church. And bring it to the house of God and follow the preacher as he reads the text. The Bible said we're to be his witnesses. Number five, they continued on to the end. Now they didn't say let's stop here, we've gone far enough. They said let's just go right on to the end. They continued on the end. Verse 12, the Bible said they turned not to the right hand, not to the left. And it went right to the end of the journey. Didn't, didn't let up. Didn't uh, leave the straight and narrow way. Didn't fall by the wayside. They pulled that ark right to the end of the journey, exactly where they were supposed to. They didn't quit. Now, beloved, listen to me. If you're saved, you got to keep on keeping on and serve God right on to the end. Dear man told me yesterday, and I, I have my opinion of what he told me, but he was uh, disturbed about it. He said his brother got saved many years ago and said his brother uh, felt like God wanted to preach and he finished college and went to the seminary and said just like maybe two or three months now fin- finishing the seminary and said he feels like now that God didn't call him to preach at all. Don't feel like he's been called to preach. He said, Preacher, I can't understand that. I said, do you believe that's the devil making him doubt whether or not he's called to preach? Well, I said, I don't know. It's possible. But I know what I think about it. I, it's either he wasn't called to preach and started out thinking he was called to preach because a man that's called to preach got God in his heart and calling his soul. He, he can't stop. There's no way out for a God-called preacher but the graveyard. And but maybe what happened might have happened that seminary wrecked his faith. And when they got through with him in the seminary, he didn't believe anything. And his faith has been wrecked and ruined, never mounted anything for God. May die premature death if he's ever been called of God. Beloved, some of these modern liberal seminaries are ruining these young men. They're ruining them every day by the, by the scores. And so I, he was burdened about it, and I could understand that. But there's a lot of people in the ministry today that they got no business being in the ministry. God didn't call them. They, um, a man one time said he saw a P, a letter P up in the cloud. Said he meant, that meant God wanted him to go preach, but come to find out that God wanted him to go plow. He got kind of mixed up. And so the letter P sometimes always don't mean preach, it may mean plow occasionally. You gotta be sure that you have the call of God. The call in the ministry is a tremendous call and a great responsibility and a terrible price to pay. If you're not willing to pay the price, don't ever move into the ministry, brother. You're in the wrong place there if God's not called you into the ministry. Be sure. If any doubt about it, be sure. And if any doubt about it, don't fool with the ministry because you're asking for pro- uh, trouble and problems sure enough. If God called you, well and good. So they continue to the end. We're to run the race. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we'll reap if we faint not. In due season, don't be weary in well-doing. God's people grow weary sometimes. You shouldn't do that. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, always abounding the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God said what you're doing for Him is not in vain. You're doing it for God. You're serving the Lord. And whenever you serve God, remember you're doing it for Him. Not necessarily for the preacher or any other individual, but for God. And so keep on keeping on to the glory of God. Number six, at the end of the journey, they brought great joy. The Bible says in verse 13, And the way of Bethlehem were were, were reaping uh, their wheat 
And they of Bethlehem was reaping their wheat, harvest in the valley, and they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it coming. Now these people at the end of the journey where the ark was to be left or carried to, they looked up and they saw those cows coming down the road. And they, they knew they had the ark of God on that cart. And brother, they had a jubilee time. They started shouting and praising God and rejoicing and glorifying God and probably clapping their hands and jumping up and down. Uh, these cows brought some real joy to those people. Now, if you're saved, God wants you to bring joy to his children. God wants you to be a blessing to his people. And you can do that. You can bring real joy in your home and to God's people. They brought joy at the end of the journey. And you want to do likewise. In Psalms 126, verses 1 through 3, the Bible said, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, and we were like them that dreamed, then was our mouths filled with laughter, and our tongues were singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord have done great things for them. The Lord have done great things for us, whereof we are glad. And so the Bible said their mouths were filled with laughter when they realized that God had done great things for them. And so these cows brought great joy at the end of their journey. Finally, number seven, they became an offering of sacrifice at the end of the road. Now verse 14, and the cart came into the field of Joshua, a Bishamite, and stood there where was a great storm. And notice they clave the wood of the cart. They tore up the cart and offered the kind a burnt offering unto the Lord. So they took the ark off, busted up the cart, made a wood out of it, and uh, made, uh, we'd call, I guess, splinters out of it, and piled them up and set them afire there on the stone and and they killed those cows and sacrificed them on the altar. These cattle became an offering of sacrifice at the end of the journey. Gave their lives. They left their all, left all they had. They left their calves back home. Did the job they were called on to do. Regardless of the cost of the sacrifice. Came the other way. And then gave themselves there on the altar as a sacrifice for the people. When we come to the end of life's journey, we need to bow down and say, Jesus, we don't deserve anything. You did it all. You saved us. You worked through us. And we were all to you, dear Lord. And be willing to lay everything on the altar for the Lord Jesus. Many years ago out here in Texas, there's a car accident. There was a little girl seriously hurt. There's a man and his wife and two children, a little, little boy and a little girl. And she was seriously hurt and losing a lot of blood. They checked her blood and she had a very rare type blood. And they said, we got to have some blood or she'll never make it. They had none in the hospital. They called the Red Cross. They called many places. They could not find her type. And she was gradually dying. She had to have it. And they decided then to check the members of the family. And they checked her little brother. And lo and behold, he had the same type of blood that she did. And they said to him, said, uh, said your, your sister needs your blood, son. Say, would you be willing to give your sister blood? He thought for just a moment. He said, yes, but said, uh, let me first go and tell mom and daddy goodbye. And then I'll give him a blood. Now that little fellow thought that he is going to die. They're going to take his blood and put it in the veins of his sister and he was perfectly willing to die that she might live. He didn't realize they just wanted a portion of it. He thought he was going to take it all and that would be his end. But he was willing to do it. What are you willing to do for Jesus? What are you willing to do for him? Are you willing to suffer hardship, criticism, what not for the Lord? I hope you are. These old milk cows put the average Christian to shame. Let's stand our feet. Dear Heavenly Father, I bring the message today that you laid on my heart. You sent the people here you want to hear it. And out in the radio listening audience, you had those that you want to hear this message tuned in. Now I pray that you'll use it and speak to our hearts. And we realize these two old milk cows puts the average Christian to shame today in what they were doing 
in carrying the ark of God. Help us, our Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Debbie is going to play for us on the organ. Now, listen to me. If you're here and you need to get saved, you need to come back to God, or you want to join the church in the way we receive members, where you might present yourself. But she's going to play a number for us, a stanza or so, and open the way for you to come forward if you need to come for any reason.